We need to know how to follow you in your plan. We need to be able to live this life in such a way that you will get glory and honor from us. I ask you by your might and your power that you would teach us and show us the revelation of who you are, how you describe the way that you want this world to be, as well as who you are and who we are, so that we can understand what our duty is to you and that we can enjoy you and that we can be with you and fully enjoy you forever. I ask these things in the blessed name of your holy child, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. Amen, amen, and even so, amen. Here we are again, making me happy, going back to the book of Numbers. Now, as a boy, I want to share this with you. At about age 17, I heard a man preaching. I believe the first one was John William Oliver. And the other one was by the name of Byron Dunn. Two things, two things happened that startled me in my life. Because I had read what we call the New Testament. And at that time, I had a very good memory. I, I remember I could read, remember chapters seemingly in about three or four hours, um, and, and I liked it. I could recite the chapters, etc. Notice the verb that I'm using. <laughs> I could do. It was, it was something that I had an ability to do then. But what happened one day, John William Oliver was preaching, and he was preaching about some people threw a man's dead body inside of a cave, and he touched another man's body, and the man got up and walked. That was it for me. I determined at 17, it would never be another man on this planet that will ever tell me something in the Bible that I did not know or I hadn't read. I said they may understand it better than me, but it will not be anything that they can ever say or tell me out of the Bible that I hadn't read. Then another man buttressed that, that one that I told you by the name of Byron Dunn. Now we call these men elders in the church that I grew up in, but he was preaching one day about God feeding the children of Israel angel food, corn from heaven. That just, I hadn't read that. Where is, mm, cause I had a problem reading the song because it didn't seem to tell a story. It didn't seem to be connected. So I made up my mind and I started reading and you, if you know my mom, you can ask her. Not for years, I would read. I remember having a job and getting excited. I would get happy if I was sick because I wouldn't just lay out. But if I had a cold and wasn't going to work, I would get so excited. I'm going to get to read my Bible and read my Bible. Tim, why are you telling us all this? I thought you were going to tell us about the book of Numbers. When I started reading, because I was already familiar with what is called the New Testament, I started reading from the beginning. I started reading from Genesis on through. Listen to me. The book of Numbers was hard at first because in the first couple of chapters, we deal with military sense, uh, censuses. We deal with certain things. We're dealing with numbers. I didn't fully understand what was going on at that time, but I had made up my mind that I was going to read it and I wasn't going to give up. And I forced myself to read it. Now, looking around 41 years later, and even before the 41 years later, but I'm saying especially now, I understand not only what Yahweh was doing, he was allowing you to understand these people are not figments of the imagination of people. He's letting you know that these are families of the people. These people have names. It has his name inside of the name. Those names of those people are very important for us to understand that he's dealing with family. And if you want to understand what it means to rule according to God's will and according to his way, get your family right. If you don't get your family right, if you don't understand what leadership is, if you don't understand what authority is and where authority comes from, you're not going to be walking in a biblical way. Don't ever think that the book of Numbers has nothing to do with you because, I'm going to slow it down. 
not for me. I like it when I get to rolling because it's like, man, what's that taking over? Romans 15 and 4, don't ever forget this. The Apostle Paul, he was telling the Israelite people, although he was writing to the people in Rome, there was a mixture there. There were some people that were in subjugation. If you don't think there were people in subjugation there, you haven't read the book of Luke. You should have read the book of Luke by now. Because when you started in the book of Luke, it lets you know in the days of uh, Augustus, the whole world was taxed. Now, Augustus is the emperor that they would call, well, his name was Octavian. But the point being made, they were under Roman rule. So when he writes to the Romans, he's got some Jews there. And he says, you have some Greek there. If you notice, I don't say Jew. I try not to say Jewish a lot. Because I want you to understand these were a group of people. They were Israelites. These are descendants of Abraham. An individual can be Jewish and never have anything to do with Abraham. Just like I can be Buddhist and have nothing to do with Buddha. I can be Marxist and, ne and not be a descendant of Karl Marx. So the point that I'm saying is, he told those people, he's got a Hebrew group of, a group there, he told them whatever thing were written a four times, when somebody says, you say whatsoever, really, you want to you wanna have a problem with me on that? Things were written a four times were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Notice it was written for our learning. There's a learning that must be done. Listen, listen to me, Israelite. Listen to me, people that have become a part of the Israel of God because of the Gentiles being grafted in. Well, we talk about the Israel of God when you read in Galatians chapter 3 and you move down around to the 28th verse. Understand, it was written for our learning. Do you want to learn? Have you ever heard people quote this, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge? That's not the whole scripture. It says because you have rejected knowledge, you will no longer be a priest to me. It's imperative that we don't reject knowledge. And most of us reject knowledge. We have most of the time rejected the book of Numbers. But it was written for our learning. Notice this, that we through patience, not patience like, yeah, yeah, I, I'm in line in traffic and you can use it there, but you have two Greek words. You, you have one that deals with the patience of putting up with stuff and there's another one that's enduring. That we through patience and comfort. Notice, when you're enduring whatever's going on in your life, when you don't like the way God is moving, huh? You don't like the when you don't like the way that God is moving, but you know that He's God, and your mind is the one that needs to be reset, not His. When you don't like the way God is moving, and the comfort that you get from knowing that He always is right and He knows what He's doing, and you look back through the Scripture, it says you find hope that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. What kind of hope? What kind of hope makes not a shame? The hope that makes not a shame is though that the love of God is spread in our heart or shared in our heart and therefore that we have a goal that we are going to meet. Tim, you quoted that last time and I quoted it this time. And in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, Paul tells his young protege, preach of the gospel, he tells him, in 3 and 16, all scripture, no New Testament was written then. It is given by the inspiration of God. Theopneustis. That doesn't mean, it means to be God-breathed. It's not like I get inspired to go play ball. I get inspired to go on a diet. No. God's breathed. It is inspired or breathed by the inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine. Understand me. Everybody that you meet has a doctrine. They may not identify it, but often 
hear me and hear me well. I'm going to try to say it in my most profound voice. I don't know which one I'm going to try to make up, but I'll try to make up one. You have a doctrine, whether you've identified it or not. And often, church people's doctrines will be based upon the traditions that have been given by those that came before them. Sometimes it'll be based on the traditions of the Nicene or anti-Nicene or post-Nicene fathers. I own all three sets and I own much more. And a lot of times they would say things that were not biblical, but people follow them. Sometimes they'll be based upon people's preferences, their doctrines. And when those doctrines are given to some people that don't read and have not read the whole counsel of God, those people will feel because they got a leader, they'll feel because somebody can speak more uh, eloquently than they can to in this world is this person. I actually grew up in a church that had the nerve to say, there ain't nothing right but the church that we're in and any other people, uh, any other doctrine, they would go to hell because they were not in the holiness church that we had and then they would give a caveat and take it back and say, unless it's just like ours. When you read the word of God, and you read it as it is in the scriptures, you will find that some doctrines got to go. You will find that some doctrines are just man-made. You will find that some doctrines are based upon somebody that is reading an English text. And God knows English. I thank God for the English text because I am speaking my slave master's language. This was not the language of the slaves before they came to America. English was not always a language. If you know anything about Sir Francis Bacon, and if you know anything about how they talk about Shakespeare, how he promoted the English language in his plays, and you begin to understand and you learn about that language makes cultures, and cultures will determine laws, and it will can determine the type of doctrine that people have because culture is always religion acted out. It doesn't have to be written down. Is religion acted out? Tim, why are you telling me this? I'm telling you this because you want to have the you want to have the ability to get rid of whatever somebody has given you as a doctrine that is not in line with God's word. Because when you stand before God, you are accountable. Your pastor, your bishop, your prelate, whatever, they're going to be accountable for what they taught you. But the scriptures are written for your learning. You all, we all supposed to know him. His laws are supposed to be in our heart. According to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1, the man that's supposed to be a man of God, he is supposed to take the oversight of God's people without grudging and to do it willingly and not to be a lord over God's heritage. You can't let somebody be the lord over your heritage because they know 500 scriptures and you know two. What they're supposed to do is become the servant, not your dictator to slap you down like a dog, rub your face in the grease. The greatest among you is to be the servant. And we're presenting to you, in Seeking Truth, the book of Numbers to get you to that place. The New Testament is full, it's replete with telling us to go back to the source the New Testament, as we see it, will explain, it will show, and not only that, you will be able to hermeneutically bring them both together, that you will have your own systematic theology in your mind that lines up with the scripture. You may not know everything about it, but you won't be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of man and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. That's about Ephesians chapter 4 around 14th and 15th verse. He didn't want you to be children. That's what it's talking about. So the purpose of the book of Numbers is one. I want to bring this out. Our inheritance. We have an inheritance and an inheritance and it was about getting land. In order for you to be a kingdom, in order for you to rule on earth as it is in heaven, you need an economic base. The economic base is not going to be tied up in what you got digitally. 
Because in digital world, they can remove one decimal point and destroy you. It was about land. It was about conquering. It was about spreading the kingdom of God. So by the time you get to the New Testament, listen to me and listen to me well, so that you can learn to understand the scripture and not be crippled by any man that calls himself a man of God. I don't care if he calls himself a pope, a pope, a papa, people, people. Pope is the Latin for father, okay? I don't care if he calls himself your spiritual dad or your covering or your bishop or your archbishop or your pastor or your elder or your reverend. If they're not in line with the word of God, you need to be in line with the word of God. Now listen to what the book of Numbers is going to teach you. The book of Numbers is going to teach you that God's kingdom rules and is not ruling over people that want to be ruled. So when you see in the New Testament, when the master get up from the grave in the 28th chapter and he tells them to go into all the world and he tells them to preach and he tells them to teach all nations and it tells them to observe everything that I command unto you. Observe is the Greek word and the Greek word that is tereo. It means he wants them to listen and do and be obedient to what he said. You teach them to observe all things that I command you, and Lord, I'm with you even to the end of the age. The book of Numbers is going to show you in a concrete fashion. In a concrete fashion, the book of Numbers is going to show you how that works. They are going to go and conquer lands. They are going to go in and dispossess people. And you say, but Tim, are you saying we got to go dispossess people? You know, one of the problems that we have in this modern world is we've been going to church a long time. We don't know scriptures. And by not knowing the scriptures, a statement like that, what I'm, ma what I'm making many times to people that are supposed to be in church, they'll treat it just like somebody that don't know what it says. So let me make sure that we understand what this means so that we don't go in and say, he's telling us we got to go and start a physical fight because that's a damnable lie. I would say it like this. It's a God damnable lie. And I know what I'm saying. There are certain things that God damns. How do you know he damns it? Listen to what he says. He says, when you look in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and people had a lot of mouth, and they want to replace Paul. I'm going to show you where the background of what's coming on, and I'm going to show you how numbers fit with us today. 10 and 1, 2 Corinthians, it says, Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in the presence, oh, talking about himself, who in presence and base among you, being absent and bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence, wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walk according to the flesh. Kim explain. Some people think because I'm little. It's reported that Paul was little, had bad eyes, and it didn't look like, from what I hear, he didn't look like a good looking man, but that's okay. He's telling you right here that I just look this way. And then what I say sometimes when people think I don't have know anything about God, what I say, I just look that way. It's like, I just look this way. He says, bold, which some, against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. But listen, listen, listen. But though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. We don't war with the sword and the spear like you're going to see in Numbers. But understand that concrete is letting you know when you see God's word. When you understand it for your learning. When you understand it for your doctrine. When you understand it is written for you upon whom the end of the world has come. When you understand that in them you think that you have eternal life. John 5 and 31, 39 is they that they are they are they that testify of me. I need you to understand that he says 
Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh for the weapons of our warfare. Listen, if you don't understand verbs and nouns, I think blue letter Bibles, well, blue letter Bible, sometimes you use blue letter Bible, give you the verbs and let you know what things are, first person or second person. Sometimes when you hear me teach or you hear somebody teach, it's important for you to know first person, second person, third person. I know that's a lot of work, but you would do it for school. You would do it to get to be a doctor, a lawyer, or an accountant. First person is when I say I. Second person is when I talk to Andrina. Third person is when, when I start speaking of Tim like this. Did you hear me say Tim instead of me? That's third person. I want you to see what happens here is that the weapons of our, that's first person, he includes himself, he's including the Corinthian church, the weapons of our warfare, the weapons of those, remember, even in Corinth, he's got the same issue he had in Rome, he's got some Israelite people there, he's got plenty of Gentile people there, and he's talking to what we would call the church, but the Bible calls the ecclesia or the called out, or the assembly of God, the weapons of our warfare, how we fight, they are not carnal. You are not, the, you are not Bruce Lee. You are not the heavyweight champion of the world. You're not MMA. You don't have your swords and weapons. That doesn't mean you can't have a weapon. I don't care what your pastor say. The Messiah told the disciples, when you left, if you don't have a sword, go buy one. And that was the equivalent of having a pistol in the ancient days. I know what I'm talking about. Don't play with me. So he says, but the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, whatever it is that's trying to get at you, whatever it is that won't let you take over and do God's will and his work for you, his weapons are mighty through God to pulling down strongholds. Notice, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into, look at this next word, you all, captivity. Bring it into captivity. You subjugate it and bring it in line. You subjugating it. Either it can be your prisoner under the rule of your God or it could just be left on the ground. It says, bringing, that, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, listen, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Do you want God to fight for you? This book of Numbers is going to show people going in to nations, some of them bigger. Some of them fortified. But they're going to go down and God's going to help them cast down the walls of Jericho. He's going to help them cast down their strongholds. He's going to help them cast down their gods. He's going to help them cast down their ideologies and the things that they do to little children, the things that they do to women, the, the things that they do to pervert themselves, the things that they do to exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. And the Most High God is going to bring them into captivity and he's going to cast it down and give his people the land so that they can rule it, so that they can make it on earth as it is in heaven. How dare we say that we follow God, that we are the descendants of the Israelites? How dare we say that we are part of God's assembly and we don't want to rule nothing? Everybody gets the rule. Sharia gets the rule. The Muslims get the rule which have Sharia. The other people, globalists, get the rule. Whoever controls your media, they get the rule. And we sit back and we wait for a rapture? They did not get a rapture. Their job was to go and do the will and the work of God. And the book of Numbers is going to show you. You don't just get saved. Sit back and wait. Come get me, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, you're so pretty. Oh, Jesus, we love you. Jesus, love me. This I know. Listen to me. He loves. He cares. But for a son to receive an inheritance, the son must be faithful. 
The son is to make sure that he's able to pass down an inheritance to his children, to his children's children. And that's one of the wicked things of America. America likes to take and tax your, your wealth. They like to tax your inheritance. And often they want to take it and redistribute it. And they didn't allow we black people. You don't like me saying it? Tell me I'm lying. Show me I'm a damnable lie. What inheritance did we have to give our children? When we built trillions of dollars of wealth with cotton, coal, and making, making houses and building buildings, that was wicked to take a people and to take everything that they had, their life, their time, their bodies, their sex, their communion, their love, and you take and you give them slavery. Not biblical slavery, but you treat them worse than some people treat their dogs and animals. But I'm here to show you, if you're going to follow the Most High God and you trust in him, there is no way he won't leave you an inheritance. Okay, read, read some more of this. I don't want to read no more of that. I want you to understand this is what the book of Numbers is about. I want you to understand that the book of Numbers starts out giving you accounting of people because there's going to be a military census. He's going to show you that it's important for the people of God to be prepared to fight. If you're not, you're a, you're a coward and you're a wimp. Everybody else fights. The Marxists fight. The socialists fight. The progressive fight. LGBTQ, they fight. Who else fight? Um, every kind of ism. Scientism fight. The peak globalists fight. Everybody fight. But you say you're a child of God and you want peace. Don't be an idiot. When the Bible calls the Lord Jesus the Prince of Peace, it doesn't mean he come by singing, Kumbaya, Kumbaya me. It doesn't mean he goes and gives flowers. I like to mention the movie 300, but some people haven't watched it, so I'll just tell you this way. When a king of a country, let's say king here, wants king over here. This king is a mighty army and he's strong, but you, you, in your land, you all have a lot of sheep. We don't have a lot of sheep. I'm going to go and take the sheep in this land over here. So what I'll do before I go and take it, I'll let them know who I am and then I have determined that I want your land and I'm going to take it. Either you can fight to the death or you can be my vassal. You can be under me. And so I want sheep and I want wool. I want some sheep that's living and I want some that you've sheared. I want you to give me wool and I'll let you live. I'll let you still be king, but you're king under me. Now, if you do this, I'm not going to let anybody mess with you because you're mine. But if you rebel against me, I'll come and take it. But these are the conditions of peace. I'm coming to conquer. The conditions of peace is give me sheep. The conditions of peace is give me wool. If you do that, We'll be okay. Anybody decide to raise it up? We can do it again. When you don't read the Bible, when you just go to church, you don't see what happened. The Bible shows you through the book of First and Second Samuel. And all of the kings, what do you mean all of the kings? Chronicles is the kings too, believe, believe me, okay? It shows you kings taking over other people's lands. It shows you other people, the Moabites, the Syrians. It lets you know about the Syria. It lets you know about Babylon. It lets you know about the Persians. And if you go into the Maccabees, you're going to even find about Greeks. But you don't have to go to the Maccabees. You can see the book of Daniel when it talks about the kingdom of Grecia or the prince of Grecia. They would come in and take. Understand when Christ came. He came. It's a melu. Different word, Tim. No, nobody really use that word anymore. There's an order that has already been set in the world so that you can understand what he was talking about when he says it. When he comes in to bring peace, notice what he says. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Notice what he says. When the Son of Man comes with his holy angels, what he's going to do with the wheat and the chaff, what he's going to do, he's going to burn some unquenchably. And the thing was his total surrender. 
You owe me. This is my world. I'm coming to claim it. So when he comes up from the grave, gets ready to do his ascension, he sends his apostles out to go and work my field. You all have to know the parable. Work my field. I'm going on a long journey. When I come back, I got to have it. So what he is doing with the military census here in the book of Numbers is letting you know you got to fight. And they would have, in some places, conditions of peace. And some they would have to totally destroy. What we need to do is see what it is they did. And then we take that and look at what we call the New Testament. And it will work perfectly. Because it wasn't just God conquering the land. It wasn't just God killing people. Those people that wanted to hear God's word and be subject to him and not fight against him, they were called God fears and they were allowed to be with Israel. But you got to read the Bible to know that. You got to read the Bible to know that. They in the center of in the center of their assembly, because he had them with the census, and he sets them off by tribes in the very center. See the palm of my hand in the very center, he would put the city. The city, uh, the the representation of the city of God. Now, somebody else will say, I ain't never seen no commentary say that. I understand. But where God is, that's, would, you, would you agree that where God is, that's where the capital is? Would you agree? And in the, where the capital is, that's where the power comes from. He had a centralized government. And he had them to erect a temple, a movable temple. So that he could move from place to place. He had the tribes to be able to live around that temple. Or they would be camped out around that temple. But he would be in the center. So that they would know whatever it is he wanted them to know. And they were to rule from the rules that came from headquarters. They would not just to go out and attack or to go out and try to take somebody's land. They were being told what to do. As I move on, I'll show you even more. Then he shows, I want to live with you. That's the point I wanted to make. I want to be in your midst. Why is that, Andrina? I'm glad you asked. The reason for that, Andrina, is because I need you to know that I got the purpose. My purpose is for you to go and make my name known. I want you to go and make this world on earth as it is in heaven. Injustice is everywhere. Satan has gotten people's minds Stirred up and no demons, they got people following them and they act like there's no me in the world. I want to show myself strong in the behalf of those that love me. I want to bless them. I want to make them strong. I want to make them the head. I don't want them to be the tail. I want the nation to look at them as the light of the world so that they may be benefiting and they may grow and they can keep my word to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through you. And your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. But with that blessing, it comes correction. And it comes a, a humbling of the nations under God first. Then, then, then he gets the Levites. Now the Levites, see, when I go through and teach these, um, let me take a sip of water, cover my mouth and eat it. When I go through these, chapter 1 and 2, I'm going to probably break it up in such a way because I want to keep the attention of those that are listening and, and show them the sons of the four wives that Jacob have. Now, some will say he just had two and two concubines. Fine. You, if, you want, if you want to parse that, you can do that. But I want you to see the names of these people, and one of them was Levi. And then we'll have to go back and see why Levi was made the firstborn. Firstborn means preeminent. Please understand that. Preeminent. Then I may show you at that time that we are supposed to be members of the firstborn. The firstborn were made to be the priests. They are the preeminent ones, not the first. So when you hear the Jehovah's Witness call the Christ the firstborn, meaning he was born first, that's because they don't read the scriptures. The firstborn, I think it's, I'm almost positive this uh, Exodus 4.24. If it's not 424, it's 422. And you can bet on that. Because uh, I know where I know where it lives. But the Bible says, Moses, you go tell Pharaoh, Israel is my son. He's my firstborn. Israel was not the first nation. Not even close. As a matter of fact, Israel didn't come before Isaac. He didn't. And Israel didn't come before Abraham. 
but Israel was the preeminent one, and God chose him. And so the Levites or the priests, and the priesthood were to guard the temple, guard the tabernacle, because I say temple, sometimes I mess up and say temple, please don't be Please don't be ignorant and think because I say temple, I don't know it was a tabernacle. It functioned as a temple. Can we? Can I get a little piece of agreement on that? So God would be dwelling in the midst of them. The Levites were supposed to be around it. There was not supposed to be anybody that would come and profane the temple. Even if you came and just wanted to peek, peek inside of it, you could be put to death if you were trying to lift up that curtain. Why? Because he was teaching them the difference between the holy and the profane. Would to God that we would look at that and realize that we are supposed to be the temple of God. Let me show you. It's very important that I show you that as we move on. It's Second Corinthians chapter 6. And I want you to look at something. I was just going to read 16. I will read that, but I'm going to show you why I read it. In, in 6 and 16, Second Corinthians, it says, And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? You will be put to death for that, okay? If you tried to bring an idol to the temple of God, you'd be killed. The reason that Antiochus or Antichius, as some people call it, Epiphanes, were able to do that in the book of the Maccabees and burn a pig is because the Most High God had already sold Israel because of their wickedness, okay? But you wouldn't know about that if you hadn't read the book of Deuteronomy. You wouldn't know about it if you hadn't read the prophets. But the prophets would tell them what Moses said that God would do. But it says, what agreement is the temple of God with idols? Listen, for ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, when? When? He said that back when we go in numbers. He said that when we were looking and seeing what he was saying back in Exodus. And in Leviticus, we'll see the sum total or the culmination of him saying and expressing that. I will dwell in them and walk in them and will be their God and they shall be my people. Now, if you don't understand, you say, Tim, it, I ain't never seen nowhere in the Old Testament where God say, I want to do that inside of them and do all these kind of things. But, 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 do you remember Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33? But this will be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, say of Yahweh, I will put my law. Do you think you can have God's law without having him? I will put my law in their inward parts and will write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Where was the Ark of the Covenant? Inside of the temple. What was inside of the Ark of the Covenant? Guess what? When he put the Ark of the Covenant, that became his footstool, didn't it do it? It was a replica of his throne, and inside of that was a table of stone, and God's power emanated from that. But if you look at Leviticus, chapter 26, are you with me? Verse 12, he said, and I will walk among you, and will be your God, and you shall be my people. And in the book of Numbers, he puts them there to let you know with this moving tabernacle, which was covered in animal skin, that one day I'm going to walk among you. I'm going to walk among you in flesh. But right now, while you're carrying it, I'm walking in your midst. Paul takes that same motif and say the book, he's not going to say it like this, but the book of Numbers should help you understand what the great privilege this is. I've walked inside of you in your camp forever. That's why I had you all around it. Because I'm in the midst of your camp. But what I'm going to do is take you high. I'm going to take the training wheels off and not just be there visibly. I'm going to be in you. Go, oh, we ought to love the book of Numbers. But where did that, where, where did that come from? Let's go quickly. 6 and 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship have a righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion have light with darkness? And what concord of Christ with Belial? Or what part of he that believeth with the infidel? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? The rhetorical answer to that should be none. You are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them. Come out from among this world system. 
Come out from amongst your culture. Come out from among being the person that feel like I got to have everything now and what God say, I'll deal with it later. Come out from among the procrastinators. Come out from among those that doubt. Come out from among them and be separate. Save the Lord and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Do you see that qualification there? But notice this. And I will be a father unto you. And you shall be my sons and daughters. Said the Lord Almighty. And then it says, Having therefore beloved, uh, having, de having therefore dearly beloved these precious promises, let us, look, look at what it says. I'm going to read it. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. If you don't know the book of Numbers, how they had to take care of the temple, how they had to take care of the temple because God's spirit was there, you would think, oh, that's just something they did in ritual. That was ritual. That's the training wheel. That's the part that we don't do now. We don't do a temple. What we do is now we got the training wheels off. We need to be doing ourselves. We ought to quit lying. We ought to quit slandering. We ought to quit fornicating. We ought to quit mistreating people. We ought to quit abusing people. We ought to start taking our marriage vows seriously. We ought to take our vows to God seriously. We ought to take our family seriously. We ought to take everything, even on our job, seriously and perfect. God's word and his holiness in that land. If not, we are defiling the temple just like somebody bringing an idol in it. That's what I'm saying. Then he gives the service of the Levites back in Numbers. And then we'll be dealing with in the fifth chapter purification and restitution. In other words, the first thing God set up was, and it's very important that you see it, protection. They already knew that they were under God from the book of Exodus and Leviticus. Then he sets up protection. Then he says that I'm in the midst. I'm in control. Then he says in the control of the people, you are under my auspices. I've got people in authority for you that know my word. Then he starts dealing with how you're going to deal with somebody if you steal, if you do wrong. How are we going to deal with restitution? Because my government has to have justice. You're not going to just steal from people. You're not just going to rape. You're not just going to rob. You're not just going to pillage. You're not even just going to do anything that you want to. This is my government and you are, represent you are representatives of me. The whole world needs to look at you and want what I have. So we're going to set up purification and justice. He's going to even set up a trial or a way that you can go by and tell if a man had a wife and he just thought she had cheated on him. He's going to allow them to have uh, a methodology to not just mistreat that woman because you think she did something, you're going to whip her tail. You're going to kick her and stump her. No, I'm going to have something set. So that we can go through and tell if she did wrong. And if she did wrong, you'll see the evidence. We, we, we can talk about when we get there. And if she did right, how she going to be blessed for having been falsely accused? Then you're going to find out about a Nazarite. You're going to find out why the world system often, when it tries to copy God, it does differently. You see, the Nazarite will let his hair grow. But uh, people that are the equivalent of that in other religions, they shave their head months and all of those. They shave. The Nazarite let his hair grow. Not only did he let his hair grow, he would not eat grapes. He would not drink wine or any of that. And people take that and tell people they can't drink wine. Now, that's a damnable lie because the Lord Jesus drunk it or the Messiah drunk it. As a matter of fact, he said, you call me a wine bibber. You call John the Baptist you say he got a demon because he won't drink with you. But I tell you, this wisdom is justified of our children. But when you're doing the Nazarite vow, it puts you in a position that you're going to have the same kind of position in so many ways like a priest. We'll talk about it when we get there. We're going to talk about blessing. How you can, uh, uh, you can have God's name on you as a blessing. But I want you to understand something. If someone ever asked God to bless you and keep you and be gracious to you and make his face shine upon you and give you peace and you live in a wicked life, do you really want God's name on you when you're doing wickedly? Because now you're breaking the second commandment. 
It's the second or the third. You shall not take my name. Second or third commandment. You will not take the Lord's name in vain. You got his name on you. And you're not doing like you should. You're putting yourself in a position to be damned. I don't care what your preacher say. Why should I care what your preacher say? Both of us are going to die. And both of us are going to stand before him. And I'm going to stand before him having told you the truth. Then we're going to deal with offering. When you offer and you give money and your different things that you do, what's going to happen with the offering? How are you going to take care of the Levites? How are you going to take care of them and the work that they do? Because that's their job. They're not going to get the inheritance that the rest of you all do. You, In other words, um, my government is not separated church and state, as we call it. It's the kingdom of Yah. It's the kingdom of God. It's his kingdom, and we war, and we have rules. We have rules for us to get along. We have rules for us to always know what he says. We are supposed to be gathering wealth. He's going to bless us with what we need in this world. He said, the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. This is being enacted there. Then they're going to go through and have another Passover. And then the Most High God is going to do something magnificently wonderful for them when they get ready to go out. He's going to bring in a cloud. And that cloud is going to be upon it. And they're going to be able to see that when the cloud sits still, don't you move. When that cloud moves, they have to camp up. And we're going to see how God has them to wrap up everything. We're going to see the very equivalent of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where the Holy Spirit gives to every man his gift as he will. We're going to see it with the training wheels on in a concrete form. Every group going to have the thing that they're supposed to do. Some going to wrap up the temple and carry it. Some going to carry different parts of the temple. Some are going to do other things, and we're going to, we're going to see that, and we're going to see that some of that mimics the angels or the cherubim carrying God in Ezekiel chapter 1. But we're going to see it's all about him. Then we're going to see something in, about the trumpets. He's going to start showing what the trumpets, blowing the trumpets mean. So when you see all these trumpets in the New Testament and you get all excited at the last trump and the trump of God shall sound and you don't know the background of it. We want to know the background so we can understand, so that we can feel the texture. We can taste the richness of the New Testament so that we can hear the symphonic sounds is coming out. We don't want, that's why some people don't understand 1 Corinthians 14 when it talks about speaking in tongues. And you got people going, uh, yabba yabba do zibaba. Are you happy to yabba yabba do? Are you got some coming in a Honda? And I, my aunt used to say, oh, what did she just say? How you like what's on the Honda? And she wasn't she a righteous woman before she died. Yeah, eat him on Sunday. I knew one lady say, I can tell you this much. I had more confidence in her than I had in most people. Yes, I did. But anyway, the point being made, when Paul makes the statements about the trumpets and the unclear sound, and if the sound is not understood, how is it that the people are supposed to know what they do? Where do you think Paul got that from? From watching the Romans? No! It's in our Bible is going to let us know that we should use great plainness of speech whenever we give warnings, whenever we teach, and we got something to say to the glory of God. People should be able to understand it, to know how to react. Why do you think he tells the people, you need an interpreter? God has interpreted already what those trumpets would mean. We're going to cover that. Then we're going to make start making journeys from Mount Sinai to Mount Perrin, following and seeing what God says. Then we're going to see God allowed Moses to bless the people. Rise up! Rise up, Lord! It's time for us to do what we got to do. I would say it's time for us to rise up. Oh, my dear brothers and sisters, those that share my ethnicity, tell what about the rest of America? That government, I can speak to my people if I want to. You can speak a 
on the behalf of dogs that's being mistreated. You can speak on the behalf of a spotted owl. You can speak on the behalf of an Amazon without mentioning us. You can speak in the behalf of people in Chicago. You And I can't speak to our people when we need this God. When we are being abused, I will speak to us. Listen to me. We need to rise up and adhere to God and let him be in our midst so that we can do our part to make it on earth as it is in heaven. Now, have I excluded anybody else? No, I just didn't mention them. I've already talked about an Israel of God. But who else have been in this country 400 years and have paid the price that we paid with blood, sweat, being raped, having our men thrown down on the ground and tied in front of their wives and children in front of the whole community and raped and raped and raped and sodomized and call it breaking a buck. And now they're going to tell us that's the new black? We need to rise up and see what God is wanting to do in our midst so that we can fight with the weapons of the warfare that he's given us so that we can have our inheritance, not only in the land and the world to come, but right now for our children and our children's children. Then, then, then they start to complain. They start to have problems with God, and God is going to show in the book of Numbers. He's not the one to be toyed with. Remember I told you all that I was young and I started reading the Bible? One of the things that made me stick with it, I want, one, I wanted to be a preacher. But, because I thought the men that were over me were, I really thought they were men of God. I mean, men of, they said God, like G-A-W-D. -G uh, I don't even understand. They said God, Maud, okay, G-A-U-D. Because they rhyme with Maud, men of God. And they could even do the walk like Hitler. You know, they would have what it's called, like a board of elders. They would buy a black suit and they would do that walk. And they would be like, ooh. Listen to me. I kept reading the Bible because it was fascinating. It was interesting. It kept my attention. So you're going to see these people complain and God's going to hear it. And you're going to see how God deals with people. And what we need to understand, please hear me. Don't ever think that when you see God smite people in the Hebrew scriptures, that he's forgotten how to smite. All you got to do is just ask yourself, if they had a coroner back then, and a coroner with a, with a, coroner with a scientific mind, where they have about what they call a priori, determined that there's no supernatural, the coroner said, maybe this person died with a heart attack, stroke, kidney failure, ungodly, having known how God was, and he would smite me. You remember me telling you sometime, and I would try to stay awake at night so I wouldn't go to sleep, so I wouldn't die in my sleep with the asininity of perversity that he couldn't kill me while I was awake. Oh, what a foolishness of Tim. But then we're going to see him spread his spirit on people. It's not going to be something they had to manufacture. He's going to show the authority and the position of leadership, and he's going to do every time men. So if you want to go with this feminism, and you want to go with this egalitarianism, and you want to buy into that, then you're going to, uh, you're going to have to understand everything you see in Numbers. You're going to see it in the New Testament. They said the 12 tribes around and God was in the midst. God chose, God's son came to earth and he chose 12 men and he was in the midst. Didn't he do it? And then he sent out other 70. Didn't he say it? He did. They were men. Men, we got a role to play. We're supposed to be the ones to protect. That's why he made the armies. That's why he took them from, we, we, we're not going through it all tonight, but he had a certain age group that you are supposed to protect the women. You're supposed to protect the mother of your families. You are supposed to protect the mothers of your families. You're supposed to protect the elderly. You're supposed to protect the children. They're supposed to be able to depend on you. You are supposed to represent God Almighty. 
And you out here wanting to play. And how many women you can lay up with. Now you're laying up with the boys. We are not doing God's work. Then we see the people start complaining because they don't get everything I want. We don't like the way God's doing things. And they start crying for quail. They cry for food. And we're going to see God provide them the most amount of food you ever seen. We're talking about they're going to have a foul dinner. Now, that's F-O-W-L, a foul dinner. And we're going to see how it returned, how it became foul, F-O-U-L. It's going to be bad. It's going to be bad. Then you're going to see family rise up. And they know that God has chosen Moses. And they're going to try him. They want to be equal with Moses. They don't respect what God has given. Didn't mean that they couldn't talk. Didn't mean they could never have a disagreement. But they wanted to feel like Moses had the spotlight. Imagine you got over a million people and you the leader. And God dealt with them. It's going to be exciting when you see God smite somebody with leprosy. Bam! It's going to be so good, so fast, so quick. Then you're going to see God try to give the people the land and they see it's hard. Just like he wants to bless us and we see it's hard. I mean, Lord, they got CNN pumping in our mind. They got Fox. They got ABC, NBC. They got the schools. They got corrupt churches. Our culture is against us. Other cultures are coming in America. Lord, how can we do your will? It's too big, Lord. They are giants. And God tells them, go out there. And only two men say, you know what? As big as they are, our God is bigger. So we see the people turn into cowards. And God's going to do some magnificent stuff we're going to go through. But if you notice in the book of the Revelation, 21 and 8, you ever, if you ever just memorize that scripture where it says, but the fearful, first thing you start with the fearful. Next, unbelieving, the murderers, the abominable, the sorcerers, and uh, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Notice it said fearful. Fearful, then unbelieving. But you see that, you see that in the book of Numbers. Then you're going to see how hypocritical people were and they go try to go back and recapture what they had. You ever see people try to go back and recapture what they lost and they mess up? We're going to see that. Then we're going to see the people decide what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to be equal and we're going to run stuff ourselves. We're going to have us a democracy. We don't like how God's dealing with Moses. And you're going to watch God make the earth open. It's going to open up and swallow some people up. Man, can you imagine reading that at 17, 18 years old, how exciting that was? In my mind, I remember saying, I wonder if I would have tried to look to see if there was a crease in the ground. You know, like inch two to try to see where they were. It's so good. Then we're going to see that God have to deal with people when they want to demand their rights. Then we're going to see God allows the people to see that I have a way of showing you who's in charge. He's going to raise a dead stick to life. Do, do you hear me? He's going to show he's got the ability to raise the dead way back here. Because if he takes a rod and make that rod bud, and that rod bears fruit, he's showing he can raise the dead. Then he's going to show about the tithe. Then he's going to show in here, we're going to go through the things about a red heifer. We're going to, in case somebody's dead. You know how nowadays people die and you can't find them? You wouldn't have that in Israel. Because we got certain things that we can go through and test. I wish to God we had Urim and Thummim now. Every time the news say something about somebody, we take the Urim and Thummim. And if they lie, we give them God's penalty. After a while, the news will start being the truth. They stop telling lies. Then we're going to find that they go out and God's going to let them be tested with water, with the necessities. What happens when you don't see the necessities? Are you going to trust God? What are you going to do? The book of Numbers is going to show us. Remember, I, I quote it slowly. That the scriptures were written aforetime, that we through patience and what, Andrina? Comfort. Of the scriptures might have hope. Why do you think he's letting you see the people go through with the waters of Meribah? Why do you think he's letting the people complain that they didn't have quail? 
because I need you to know that no matter what happened, I got it. I know what I'm doing. I've been guarding a long time. You don't know how to guard. You barely do many times. Lord, to take care of your children and do what you say. When I gave you a position to be like me in a limited sense, you have to do that. I told you to raise them up when you, and I told you to go with them by the way. I told you how to treat them. I told you to teach them my law, but you don't teach them my law. You send them to school and let them learn the things of the Gentiles and the ungodly and you let them learn the stuff on TV and you want to complain when I don't give you stuff. You don't know how to guard and all that's in them. In the Bible list, you see how Edom tried to fight against them. And you're going to see why they got problem with the Edomites pretty much forever. Then we're going to see them complaining. God sent down serpents to bite. Yes, the loving God. This is why some people say God of the Old Testament is harsh. One of the problems they don't understand is the same things and worse. A lot of times you see that the Messiah said. Then you also have battles. Then you're going to have a, you're going to have an ass talking. Well. You know, in our culture, if we say an ass talking, we just talking about some stupid person. I'm talking about a donkey right now, a donkey talking. A donkey going to have more spiritual insight and save a man's life that's beaten. And we're going to see that. We're going to see a false prophet. You know, sometimes people think that, you know, just because a person prophesies something and come to pass, they're a man of God. That's going to be dismissed in the book of Numbers. We're going to begin to understand that just because a person has a gift, just because a person can say something in the behalf of God, that doesn't mean you have to follow them. Then it's going to give prophecies about the Messiah, about a star coming out of Jacob. We're going to see why they have a problem with the Amalekites and why it is or what it was that was so bad when Saul would not destroy the Amalekites and, why he, and what happened when he lost his kingdom. It has something to go way back into numbers. Now listen to me. That was written for our learning. What is it that has attacked you the most in your life that you won't destroy, that you won't get a, rid of? Is it your pride? Is it your sexuality? Is it your is it your hatred for somebody? Because you're gonna you're gonna have the equivalent of an Amalekite more than likely. Just this job is fighting for our king. Well, you're going to see with that, and you're going to see Phinehas. Now, I'm telling you all now, Phinehas is my friend. I love Brother Phinehas. As a matter of fact, God loved him so much, he gave him a covenant of peace. Phinehas did a magnificent work. When people were actually hoeing, they were they were doing like freak nicks, okay? Right there in the public. They were they was sexuating. Yes, I made up a word. They were sexuating live, putting on a porn show. And God was killing people. And Phinehas, he did something magnificent to stop the plague. Ooh, you don't think a young boy reading that was excited? We're going to talk about Phinehas. Then we're going to read about the second census. Then we're going to learn about inheritance. How God wants inheritance to be. The importance of women. What women get in inheritance. How things go if the husband die, if the if the father die, when the woman gets to be in the position of being in charge. We're going to learn about Sabbaths and the things that God wants to do in his time and place and his religious calendar. I didn't say a Roman calendar, and I didn't say a Catholic calendar. His calendar. We're going to learn about those things. We're going to do a Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, in gathering. We're going to learn about vows. We're going to learn how important a husband is. A woman can make a vow and her husband can void it. You don't like it? Get yourself another God and be ready for hell. The father can void it. Husband can void it. But if he doesn't say anything right away when it's done, guess what? He's guilty. I'm telling you, this thing is good. Then we're going to see Midianite Wars. We're going to see God deal with with someone that has worked to curse his people. This is what we should look at. When we look at the wars of Midian, we ought to go back in our mind and think about Egypt. We ought to think about who's warring against our children now, who's warring against our mind, who's making us learn things in school that have to go to school 12 years and don't teach how to buy one stock, don't teach you what stocks are, don't teach how to fill out a checkbook, 
Don't teach you how to count or know what therms are when you're buying your gas. Don't teach you how to look at different things and see how the prices of food going. Don't teach you how to be able to represent yourself or to go in court and they fix it when you got to go through somebody else. That's wicked. You can't even defend yourself without spending a lot of money. Don't you know that's a fixed, closed system to go against people that can't afford to, pay, to play the game? We're going to find out, we're going to see in God's word that he hit them war. We got a war going on. You don't even know it. Then he shows some people that did not want to do God's way and they wanted something else. You see, sometimes things we want may not be unlawful. They might not be expedient. And they, and they often can cost you. And that's going to be, we're going to see that with Gad, uh, we're gonna see with um, Dan. We're gonna see with Dan when he goes through and do, does what he do. We're gonna deal with Reuben, Gad, Manasseh. We're gonna deal with some of God's promises, and then he's gonna divide the land up for the people. Once he divides the land up for the people, you see that they don't get to choose inheritance. He chooses it. He chooses what he wants them to do. He's gonna give them laws dealing with murder. Those laws are still in effect today. When we get there, I'll prove it. Then he's going to show about Levitical cities. And then he's going to deal with what we are talking about here. How do we keep it going? You see, because all of that's taking place with people that's going to die. Hear me well. All of this is taking place. When I first said that he sent the people to see the land. And I compared it to CNN and I compared it to Fox and you say they're too big. Those people that were hypocritical and refused to fight because they saw the size of the enemy and not the size of their God, they're the ones that fulfill the rest of what I said we're going to go through. They're still going to have to go through and they're going to die. But the Most High is going to use that to give the children an inheritance in knowing him. Whereas they would have had an inheritance of land, still would have got to know him, would have had land, would have had wealth, would have had prestige. But now what you've left your children with is the knowledge that God doesn't play. Now you left them with the knowledge that God can provide. Now they got they got they got the knowledge, but they could have learned that while they were accumulating rulership of the earth. This book of Numbers is going to cover aspect of ruling a kingdom, having a kingdom, how to be a community. Ruling a kingdom, it's got to be done under God. Having community has got to be based on what he says community is. If we don't do it that way, we're, going to, we're really going to mess out. And then how are you going to rule it? How are you going to have community? How are you going to spread it? If we don't look at the book of Numbers correctly, we'll just see it as they get, okay, they did this, they went through the land, they did this, and we don't realize he told them, you go and you preach, and you go and you teach them to observe all that I command you to do. He had told them prior to, through Abraham, your seed will possess the gates of their enemies. Do you know that the Bible says, I believe it is in First I mean, in Galatians 3 and 16, I know it says the seed is one, the seed is Christ. But if you read on it, it says, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. If you are in Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. All this is in the numbers. It's in the census. It's in the military. It's in the law. It's in the provision. It's in trusting in him. Why? Because he's in the midst. So with that, the next time we come back to the book of Numbers, we'll be going in chapter 1. Those that are on with me, I hope that you'll go ahead and read chapter 1. Force yourself to read it. Get to, at least try to be familiar with it. I, I'm not going to tell you that it's going to be the easiest read, but do it. Do it. Because there's some meat in there. There's some instruction in there. There's some wisdom in there. Don't be the kind of person that's dependent on one pastor to tell you everything in this life, or one bishop, or one book. 
Learn the spirit to show yourself approved unto God. A workman, notice a workman that needeth not be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. With that, I'm, I'm going to stop. I feel like in that introduction I could have done much more, but I'm not. I want to go into the. I want to go into it now. Father, I thank you for your blessed word. I thank you for this book of Numbers, and uh, help me to do what's right by you. That I don't teach it and say it in such a way that it's boring, but I let the fire come out when it's time to come out, and the water come when the water needs to come out, and let the soothing and the warning come out and the comfort and the hope that I just I just be faithful to what the passage is saying when it says it. Help us all that we can look and see who we are supposed to be in you and how it is you want your kingdom to rule and what it is we can do to help it be that way. I ask these things in the blessed name of your holy Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen, and even so, amen. I'm going to now open our class for discussion, if there's any discussion to be had tonight. And then I can even be told if if I if I bored somebody, they can say if they were bored. But any questions, even if they even if it's questions on the Facebook, if anybody joined the Facebook, if they type in their questions, will you see them? Precious. Okay. I will now, if somebody type, if they have any questions. Uh, Andrea, did you hear, I hear somebody on the conference line. Go ahead. Uh, I have a question. You might have mentioned this the other night, and I, I think I know possibly the answer, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, but I might have an explanation. Why is it called the numbers? Because of the first three words, where it says, why yadaber? Why it why is it's a little thing look like a golf club um turn to the right like if you got a piece of paper to go that's to be the Hebrew letter called a wa and so and then Deborah is to speak so it's so it's wa and then it's yedaba it's and he spake and so that's what it came from in Hebrew in Latin it's libre numbre or the book of numbers. In Greek, it's arithmetic, where we get the word arithmetic. And they believe that's because of the censuses. So that's why it's called the book of numbers. So just even with that, and then the first chapter, the second chapter, people, they just pass on through it. Actually, they pass through the Torah. Whereas if they read the Torah, they would really have a better understanding of the prophets, yeah. the Psalms, because I, I thought about reading Psalm 90. I said, I don't have to do it now. I'll do it later. I don't want to take too much uh, time. But numbers would, t I mean, the 90th Psalm would tell you how to measure your days. And, and just think about what he went through with these people. Teach us to number our days. So in Hebrew, you said it to the what? Wa. And, you know how some people say, Bob. Yeah. Okay. Instead of what? Yedabah. Y e d a b b e r. Y e d a b b e r. The bar means word or to speak, uh -huh. he, but it's why he and he spake. And he spake, and then that's what the word. That's those. That's what the word means, right? Yeah, and he spake, and, and it's Yahweh, and Yahweh spake. I'm sorry. So it, and you said then in Latin and in, in Greek. Yeah, because you have what is called the. You you have what it, you have um I don't even know if they transliterated it, but it's just in the Vulgate they named it seemingly after the census the Book of Numbers. You know, because they cause we're gonna be dealing with a lot of numbers, okay. and then the Greek uh, arithmetic, where we get the word arithmetic numbers. So they went and just because. I think, if I'm not mistaken, I can look at Leviticus. I think Leviticus is named after the first word, Vaikra. Let me see. Let me click right here. And the Lord called, nope. Because it starts with the Y as well. 
I don't remember why it's called Viagra. I can look it up while we while we while we doing questions. It's almost like you're saying Viagra. 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 Oh, let me read that. It's like, honey, what you reading? Leviticus? Why? Because I, cause Tim said it's a blessing in it. And I didn't say no such thing. If, if I may be so bold as to use some uh, uh, phraseology of the heathen when they say a new world order, mm -hmm. this is what it looks like is happening here. I mean, seriously, for real. I'm talking about the possessor of heaven and earth. He's beginning a new order of things. Yes. And that this is the way that the entire earth should be ordered. Yes, very good. And so um, that was, that's something to think about in terms of, Moving forward, like <laughs> like they also say, moving forward, that you understand the righteousness and the or the righteousness and the order in which the earth is supposed to move and its inhabitants, and so the way that we're supposed to commune with each other and to commune with him and to put that into them, give that to them, and for them to take it in such a way, like most of them were sort of trite about it. And to understand the seriousness, the blessing and the severity of it, you know, to understand that this is what we're supposed to be possessing. And this is the order of things upon the earth. Not just in what they call these, these tribal groups, but this is righteousness for everybody. And his family. Yeah. Thank you. That was very, very, very good. Gary, I went and looked in the Hebrew because it was bothering me. And if people would ever get to where stuff bothers them when people ask questions, you would do more reading than you normally would. Uh, Leviticus 1 says, And he called, and the, and the Lord, or and Yahweh called to Moses and spake unto him. The and here is the wa. Okay? And and it, so it's going to be Wa, Yahweh, Yaikra. But the problem is when you look and you have the tools, you're going to look at the word order. The order is going to be and, which is going to be Wa, and instead of Va. When I said Vaikra, that's because when I would read it, they would use Yiddish. The fake, the fake Hebrew, the Yiddish is the German Hebrew that's used in Israel. That's Yiddish. Look it up. Y-I-D-D-I-S-H. That is German mixed with Hebrew. True Hebrew, like they speak in Yemen, and some of the people speak in Yemen, is Wa. So it's Wa, and then the second word is Yikra. So that's why it comes from Yaikra. Well, it's Yikra, and then Vaikra. Because it was bothering me. It's like, why I don't know this? I know it, but why I don't know it? It was, You know what I'm saying? It's like, somebody asked me a question I don't know. I said, I got this computer here, and I know how to use the software. I paid, paid a lot of money to learn how to use the software, didn't we? Mm -hmm. What else, Gary? I was just uh, thinking, you know, I like what Ann was saying about the... Me too. He told Noah to multiply whenever they came yeah. off the ark in the eighth chapter of Genesis. Yeah, the, 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 the multiplying uh, of, of just, just things. And, and, and when you say, and God said, you know, and looking at the order of things. And so I, in listening to your overview, it was, it was encouraging because I think for anyone who has time in the scriptures, whether they were fully aware of different things that was taking place, we, we 
now we can, we're, we're about to open our, uh, like where that sound is, but let me rephrase it. We're about to give ourselves the right filter for understanding biblical history that's past, present, and things to come. Mm. And in understanding that, we're going to understand that Jesus made the scriptures testify of him, Alpha, Omega, beginning, and the end. So it's, it's, I thought it was good because it's, it's, when I was listening to what you're saying, we, we could say, well, I already know that. But it's like, we know some things, but there's level upon level, mm-hmm. you know, of understanding. And so, um, sometimes when I'm talking, I'll talk about the, the pattern of man and God's pattern. The Bible says he doesn't change, so we can begin to see, what is it that displeases God? Is he the mean one that people say he is? And even if people say it, it doesn't mean he is, but he'll, he'll show himself to be who he is. And then you learn from that. And so all if you learn from what God is doing, you're going to be a lot lighter. So in, in listening at um, the, the overview, it's like here, here's part of the backdrop, you know, with um, who God is and why he is, and, 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 and really just understanding. So uh, I thought it was, thought it was uh, good. Andrea, I want you to take, take my phone. It's not connected. I see two comments, and I can't read them, so I need you to handle that for me. I know you have powers. But um, the thing that I'm looking at, Gary, is as I tried to go through it, I tried to be as comprehensive as I could without being boring. Was I able to accomplish that? Sometimes I have a problem. Well, put it like this. Most people, I mean, it's been, it's pretty much known that most people don't like the book of Numbers. They don't, they don't, they, most, I mean, most people haven't read First Chronicles, but let's, let's change my word to something else and let, let me just respond to it. That, thank you. That, that'll make me happy.
For real. Let me go. This is going to be an investment to go through these chapters. Mm-hmm. But one yeah. thing, one thing about it is, I want to come out knowing it better than I did when I went in. Yeah. And it's going to help us understand. Well, it's it's going to it's that that's the that's part of the foundation. How many it's nights, Andrina, have we listened to the Book of Numbers? I come in from work, Gary, and when I go to bed, she said, "Well, what are we listening to tonight?" And, uh, you know, I probably have played the book of numbers, you think, maybe 15, 20 times already yeah, or more. Or more yeah. And then I might listen to it when I'm driving. So it, 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 I've read it, but I want to be saturated. You pick up pick up things, you know, so that when I when I teach it, it's like I want to live there. You know, I want to live there. I want to, I want to know where the grocery store is. I I, I want to know where the little quick trip is if I need to get gas. I, I need to know who who fixed the shoes. It's like moving into another city. Mm-hmm. And we need to move into that. We need to move into the wilderness and let's see things through their eyes. And then we'll, we'll go and peek ahead to see how did the apostles explain what we were going through. Remember, there's a veil over this. I call things the training wheels, and that veil is removed with Christ. So we we don't get rid of the bike; we just move the training wheels. But 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 you can actually go back and see what did the training wheels mean? Why why did key your case in point? Why did these animals? Why are these unclean animals unable to be eaten? But Noah could eat them, and he was righteous. What happened between Noah and the, giving the commandments? The unclean animals could be eaten and Noah was still righteous. Shem was still righteous. Abraham was still righteous. But then now they're unclean. Then what happens when Peter's told to rise, kill, and eat? I'm using training wheels to teach you to be separate, to be holy, and the differences in nations. I'm yeah. teaching you about the difference. You are not to be eating their culture. You are not to supposed to be going to learning their ways. You're not supposed to be in the Canaanite school of debauchery. You're not supposed to be in Pompeii school of wickedness. I, yes, yeah. we ain't going to eat that stuff. We know what you're setting up, us up for to do. Just give us some pulse. Give us the beans. And I found out what it was because Andrina opened it up. And what was wrong? Why I couldn't get Wi-Fi? You had Wi-Fi. That was the problem. Okay. And when you had too many because too many windows open with that hand, it's uh-huh. hard to close those and just open it up on See how see how Gary is, when people think I'm smart, I, there's some things I'm ignorant about. But if it happened again, if I didn't ask, I wouldn't know. It was Marlene. Gary, there's a guy named Marlene Calendris and He's done some magnificently wonderful work in our home. He, I mean, just, and he's going to help us do some work here so that we can do more worship like we want to. I talked to him the other day, and, and he says, uh, I guess this is the Spanish for the name, El Libro de Numeros. Now, did I say it correctly, Gary? N-U-M-E-R-O-S. Numerous, okay. Well, I mean, you get paid for you get paid for teaching Spanish. I well, I do get paid too, cause people that that are Spanish give me business, but not like you. <laughs> My spe- go ahead, precious love. I was gonna say this about you know when you talk about you talking to your people. Yes. There should be some rule against that. Uh huh. But there, I find so many similarities. And in this, you talking about a people who um, lost their inheritance. Yes. And you talking about a, a people who are not a people, but he's going to make them a people. He's going to give them a culture. He's going to give them an inheritance. You talk about we are people who don't have an inheritance. Or, 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 or our people. own culture. Right. We're given a culture. Own, right. And so you see that he's building and this can teach us how to build, how to endure, how to have the patience, how to see the comfort in the scriptures. Not only that, 
I think we have being taught in a church it taught you to get rid of the Old Testament and then that means you get rid of your understanding you you lose all of your understanding and your culture and you begin to reconstruct it in American society so it's like now when I get to the New Testament now faith is something you know that is not tangible it, it could be in anything but there is some concreteness to what was a foreign. And so when you leave that, you come to, and you can let people can say whatever they believe it or think it or wish it to mean. But it's rooted and it's grounded in these scriptures here and this understanding here. So when you talked about the trumpet and what is he talking about when he's talking about a trumpet? And you say, you're not talking about the Roman trumpet. He's a Hebrew. He's going to talk about what he knows from his nation. And when we get there, I'm going to move the name from trumpet. And I'm going to go to shofar. Right. So Maybe I can get Wally to let me bring what they, they have. You've just left the understanding of what we call the old covenant. You just left all the foundation. And you're letting people reconstruct it in American culture, in Roman culture, which is still Roman, American culture, and what you call Latin culture, and this that's the Catholic Church, and everything else that was born out of it. Yes. And so we haven't taught our people how to see this as us. Because I listened to Dr. Moorcraft, and he they taught their people this. Tell, tell them what Dr. Moorcraft taught. And, and and look, and this is a white man, a white man that I call my mentor because in many things he taught me and showed me things nobody else did. Okay, does that mean that I can't breathe? Let's Doctor Moorcraft said you don't, you don't. <laughs> no, it's not like that, but it's the fact that not only did he respect me, but the man thought enough of me when he first saw me. See, I've been looking for thirty five years for a man like you didn't say it. Gave me about twelve hundred dollars worth of books or material the first day. But go ahead, precious love. I, I, and I truly believe, I truly believe that he looked at you as if you the kind of black man. He said black. I've been looking for. He said that. But see, I hear him. I listen to some of his uh, teaching, and I listen to how he talks to his people. Now, this is a congregation of basically all white people. You may have some, some a couple of people who are, and I do mean a handful that may not be. But he's talking about historically with the church. We're coming from the Catholic church and then, you know, doing, being a, a Protestant or a Reformed church, you're just an offshoot of the Catholic church. You just wanted to reform the Catholic church. But this is a Catholic doctrine that you took with you in the reform teaching. And what they did is they said, listen, the earth is ours. We're the righteous of the earth. It's, it's for us to go out and subdue it and to take these lands and to make these people Christian and to say, well, I'm going to put that in air quotes, Christian, and to inherit earth, ground, land, soil, not some mystical place up in the sky. This is how they went and did world domination. This is how the Catholic Church did it. That's just because they said we're supposed to inherit the earth. They took it literally. We don't take it literally. We're not even taught that. And so we become the victims of some of them coming over and they have something in mind. This belongs to us. We have declared you all to be heathen. We have declared you all to be unworthy of the ground you stand on. We have um, declared you to be the uh, the scum of the earth. And you need to be reformed. And you're going to do what we say. And we're going to take this land because it's by decree of this book. We have determined that we are going to be these people and we will use this book to do it. And let me, let me, let me say this in case you think my wife lying. I'm looking at the doctrine of discovery, and you can look up this word doctrine of discovery, one word, dot org. 
and you'll see it all over the web. But they say this is a one minute read, so maybe it'll take me two, maybe it'll take me 30 seconds, I don't know. But listen to what it says. Papal bulls, this comes from the Pope. Papal bulls of the 15th century gave Christian explorers the right to claim lands they discovered and lay claim to those lands for their Christian monarchs. Monarch is a word for king. And any land that was not inhabited by Christians was available to be discovered, claimed, and exploited. That means take the gold, the silver, the uranium, whatever it is. If the pagan inhabitants could be converted, they might, notice the word might, that's a subjective, they might be spared. If not, they could be enslaved or killed. Look at what the hell they're doing in Africa. And that is hell that they've done to those people in South Africa, South America, all of the places of the world. But this is Catholic Church. <laughs> Listen to it. It says it could be claimed, exploited if the pagan, notice we give you a bad name, the pagan inhabitants could be converted. They might be spared. If not, they could be enslaved or killed. The discovering doctrine, the discovery doctrine is the concept of public international law expounded by the United States Supreme Court in a series of decisions, initially Johnson versus McIntosh, 1823. The doctrine was Chief Justice Marshall's explanation of the way in which colonial powers laid claim to the newly discovered land during the age of discovery. Under it, title to newly discovered lands lay within the government whose subject discovered the new territory. The doctrine has been primarily used to support decisions in validating or ignoring aboriginal possession of the land in favor of colonial, that means white, or post-colonial governments. That's still white. John Marshall, who is most credited with describing the doctrine, did not voice wholehearted support of the doctrine even while using it to justify, and while using it to justify judicial decisions. He didn't, he didn't support it, but you use it in your justice. You're a damnable lie. It's just you and you do it and you make law. What I've learned in our world, when a white man in charge of the government write it down, it's law. They go back to it and say it's precedent. Why do you say white? Because of the fact in the land of the aboriginal and the black people that it wasn't like that. When we write it, the pen is mightier than the sword because we write it down and we say we own it. Read some more, Tim. He pointed to the, the doctrine of discovery as a simple fact. Looking at the possessions taken, his possessions dash takens, which had been supported by it and things which had occurred to be recognized. The supposedly, I have to go back to where I was. It was supported by the things that had occurred. The supposed inferior character of native culture was a reason for the doctrine having been used. But whether or not it was justified was not relevant for Marshall. This doctrine governs the United States Indian law today and has been cited recently as 2005 in the decision of City of Sherrill versus Oneida Indian Nation of New York. And if people really go back and look, there are a lot of things that were supposed to be done to black people under that that has been invalidated. So when I start saying stuff about a nation and about a people and things that are still in the laws, in the books today, when you look at international law, do you think, who do you think run the international law? We better learn that we are under, we are still under rule and we need to get up under the rule of the Most High God. He is the only one that can set the captive free. He is the only one that can break the backs of the stranglehold of the oppressor. It's not going to be by might. It's not going to be by power, but it's going to be by his spirit and the weapons of our warfare got to be mighty through God. We don't have enough. Right now, they can see everything in our house and bomb it. Oh, but if God let you take me today, you can't take, do no more than kill me. You can't take away my eternal destiny. And people still preaching, get saved. People still preaching, let's go to church. What are we going to do when he said and rule and teach all nations? 
We're not even teaching our children. First of all, we're not teaching ourselves. We're not teaching ourselves to be subject to God so that he can walk in us. He was walking in Israel. He was moving in Israel before they went to go take other nations. How dare we not see that he's teaching us through the scriptures so that we can be what he would have us to be. Bless his everlasting name that sits between the cherubim. I got mad for a little bit, but I, but it's all good. Gary, you want some more? You want some more? <laughs> well, I've been trained by Andrina not to call her name too hard, but but you know it's imperative that we see he made the culture for them. He made the culture, and I will submit to you that the culture he made for them is the culture for the world. It got to be the culture for we black people. But do it's you see great. how the wicked, see the, the boundaries were set. He would tell Israel, don't go over there into the land of the Moab, Moabites. I gave them that. Leave don't alone. go over there and think you're going to go, if you go through Edom, you just go through, you pay for your food and water, and you keep it moving. He divided it up amongst the people. Everybody had a place. And he, then, and he brings that back out in Deuteronomy 32 and 8, right? Yes, but then the unrighteous always overflow their territory. They <laughs> always go and want to possess other places, other people, because, that, the, and it's always that this, these people in particular claimed it was supposed to be in righteousness. Yes, the colonizers. The Catholic, yes, the Catholic Church and the Dutch, and the, it was supposed to be in righteousness, but that was all a lie. That was a lie. It's equal to the movie, the book. It's like the movie, the book of Eli. We you we want to use that book to control because we can if we can get people to feel like they can kill in the name of God as long as they're the killer instead of the one being killed. They love it. But we are so busy being confederate with the wicked. I like that word. We're gonna sit down with them, eat with them, make plans with them. We don't care if the people that we're planning and plotting against look like us, have the same blood we have, have the same color, came from the same people. That we're gonna that's this is why we can't do it. Because we haven't decided that this is righteousness. This is true. But we so ready to we so ready to lust after the things of this world and the people who we feel that can give them to us. We wanna be in charge with the wicked. The wicked are never going to let you be in charge. No. But they will let you be Whitney Houston and make all that money for them and die poor. They'll do it like they did Michael Jackson, like they did Prince. You don't have a, you didn't have a will. You think you're going to get money and sit with the wicked and they got not going to be wicked when it come to you. But that's who they are. This book of numbers gonna be sweet. If we don't decide to do righteousness and be righteousness, and this is our inheritance. This is our inheritance. You know what I'm scared of? Knowing that this is our inheritance, I'm scared of. You know, I wanted. To, I've been wanting to do the book of Job so long, but I'm so scared. Not scared, like. Huh. But I'm scared that I'm gonna to have to do Deuteronomy the third time after I do Numbers. I, I'm a, okay. I'm scared. What? I, I'll take a, you know what I'm saying. I'll take a, a poll as they call it from the people. It's like, do you want to see what happened next? Do you want to see what happened next? Did they ever get there? But that's good, Andrina. We got problems. I think that I'm looking. I got a book that I want, but I didn't have it out. I don't want to get up and get it. But the next Thursday when I have a, a class and we start going through and I start talking about God's standard, I may have a couple that I might give away. It's called By This Standard. For those that really are interested in seeing the law of God ruled, and say by which standard, and then I'll just determine how I want to give it away. Somebody can either, you know, put down that they want to have it. I think, Gary, you got it in your software. And if not, I mean, 
you're automatically going to get one because you work with Tim. But it's important for us to know we're going to be talking about doing things by his standards. It's good, Andrina. Kingdom. Kingdom work. We need to be throwing around the term kingdom. What does that mean? Well, we got a lot of people doing bubblegum singing and, and then bubblegum stuff and they, they, you're entertaining, but you, you're not getting people to rule. We like too much entertainment. But when it comes down to knowing the doctrine of God, we don't. And therefore, therefore somebody can be on a flat platform and preach it and you think this person deep and it tells me something about you where you think this is the only man of God ever? Really? Or what will happen if this man died for real? You mean to tell me since about A.D. 30 or A.D. 27, nobody except this one person you love. Remember like when we were told growing up, uh, not you, and you weren't with me, Gary, that if God wants you to know something, he'll tell your bishop. What? So where you get that? Who are you to tell me if God wants me to know something, he'll tell my bishop? And this is the stuff people still live under that kind of tyranny. You learn the book of Numbers, you're going to find out that God did not like to have just centralized power with one person. You're going, we're going to find out he's going to have people over thousands. He's going to have people over hundreds. He's going to deal with family. But yes, I got somebody that can, that can help you all, but he's going to see sometimes he, he don't know what to do. And the women say, this ain't right. This ain't right. And he go back and say, they right. And y'all need to know this is what's going on. Because we got to realize that God wants us to be a kingdom. We're harmony in our families, within ourselves first. Then go spread the peace in every way he wants it done. And guess what? They were supposed to be representing his throne with righteousness and judgment. I don't know if anybody else got any comments they want to make on the line. They can. It's open. I'm going to close it. You're going to be sad. At least hear me tell it. Well, I thank everybody for joining us. That joined us tonight in the Lord's will Sabbath on Saturday. We're going to go back into it. We're going to start going into the text now. I've kind of given you an overview of what to look forward to, and hopefully we will gather and we'll grow together. May the Lord bless and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. Be gracious to you. Lift up his magnificent countenance upon you and empower you to do the things that he would have you to do so that you can have the inheritance he wants you to have so that you can spread his kingdom starting with yourself throughout the earth and give you his shalom peace. Amen, amen, and amen.